Please subscribe, like and share our videos. Exclusive content brought to you here on Latif Yahya's channel only. Latif Yahya has asserted his rights under the Copyright, Designs, and Patents Act, 1988 to be identified as the author of this work. This book is sold subject to the condition that it shall not, by way of trade or otherwise, be left, resold, hired out, or otherwise circulated without the author's prior consent in any form of binding or cover other than that in which it is published and without a similar condition including this condition being imposed on the subsequent purchaser. Twelve Invading Kuwait SM's ordered to strip naked by Uday along with my other four bodyguards. They all obey without a word of protest and stand in a row in front of Uday's big baroque desk covering their private parts with their hands. Their pose is slightly bent with their shoulders drooping forwards and their heads and eyes lowered. Uday comes silently forward from behind his desk, picks his electrical cable up off it and pulls it through his hand a number of times as if cleaning it. Then he throws his hand back. His body tenses like a spring. He looks like a tennis player about to serve. With a swish, he brings the cable down on Azam's naked back. Uday continues to beat him until he bleeds. Then he whips all my bodyguards. Again and again, Uday's torture instrument comes crashing down on sensitive skin. Ten times, twenty times but Uday doesn't groan as he normally does. Uday is punishing the men and humiliating them for not having prevented me from slashing my wrists. If Azam hadn't called me on the phone to tell me that Uday was flying to Geneva for a few days, I'd have bled to death. I don't know how long I'd been lying on my bed when the phone rang. I'd just known it sounded very faint as if it was ringing in another apartment. As soon as I didn't answer, Azam had the bodyguards. Storm up to my apartment. They broke the door down, saw me lying unconscious in a pool of blood and rushed me to the Ibn Sina hospital. The doctor sewed up the cuts in my wrists by putting two stitches in each. Two days later, I'd recovered reasonably well. Now I'm standing in Uday's office watching him punish the men whose job it was to watch over me. I know he'd really like to be whipping me. He'd probably like to kill me but he needs me too much. His apparent concern over the last few days has not been for me. As ever, Uday's one and only concern is for himself. I'm his most important security precaution. Without me being his double he'd have to put himself in all those dangerous situations and Uday has ever more reason to fear them. For some weeks, it's been an open secret that something big is shortly going to happen. Further rumors about Adnan Kerala's murder are also circulating around the palace. It's suddenly being said that the reason for Adnan's death wasn't just his personal criticism of Saddam's mistress but political as well. As defense minister, Adnan Kerala apparently warned the president against an Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. It would provoke the West too much. An invasion of Kuwait can be nothing but a protective measure against American imperialism in the Gulf. That wasn't what Saddam wanted to hear. Long ago, he'd already made up his mind to bring Kuwait home. His threats on the subject are veiled but palace insiders say his plans for annexation were complete as early as the beginning of 1980. In public, Saddam tries to cover this up. He heavily criticizes Israel at every opportunity to distract from his true intentions and to get the Arab world behind him. It seems a blatantly obvious diversionary tactic but hardly anyone outside the palace seems to see through it. All the Iraqi media, particularly Uday's newspapers, broadcast Saddam's increasingly menacing threats against Israel. He continually reminds everyone that the Jewish people launched a military attack against Iraq in 1981. On that occasion, Israeli fighter jets blew up the atomic facility in Osirak. Now Saddam claims that Israel and the United States are planning another attack on Iraq and declares, if it comes to that, we will destroy the whole Jewish population with poison gas. Babel, Uday's newspaper, has the headline, Our Missiles Can Reach Israel. In his usual naive and egoistic way, Udi's forever putting his foot in his mouth with his comments. Once, with his whiskey glass in his hand, he declares patriotically to his astonished friends, everyone knows Iran's aggression against our people has cost a great deal of money. 
they forced that war on us but couldn't defeat Iraq. Now other people want to see the proud Iraqi people starve. It is a black conspiracy against our country. A conspiracy by the rulers in Kuwait. Uday pauses for a moment, picks up one of his own newspapers and quotes from a speech attributed to his father, sometimes war is fought with soldiers. They inflict damage on each other with explosives and attempted putches. At other times war is waged with economic means. Everyone listening knows the true point behind Saddam's quotation. Our state is bankrupt. We can't pay back the money we've borrowed from our main creditors, Kuwait and the Emirates. Either we persuade them to drop their claims or we ask for further help from Kuwait which we'll be able to declare as compensation for the extra oil they've taken from Rumela. As we all know, says Uday, which we all do but this doesn't stop Uday repeating his favorite sentence on the subject, Kuwait has stolen Iraqi oil worth $28.8 billion from Rumela. The southern tip of the oil field is just 5 kilometers inside the Kuwait-Iraq border. So we would only need to move the border a few kilometers and all our worries would be over. Yet again, his observation confirms that the palace hierarchy are seriously considering starting a war against Kuwait. Because not even the most naive person could imagine Kuwait would voluntarily allow the border to be changed. And Saddam is appearing on television every day telling us that Kuwait isn't merely stealing Iraqi oil but waging a hidden attack on our country through chronic over-extracting of it. This excess has brought the price of oil crashing down from $20 a barrel to just 14 As a result of this aggression on the part of Kuwait, our country is losing more than a billion dollars a year, moans Uday, adding. It's like a stab in the back with a poison dagger and a direct attack on my father. I've never seen Uday like this before. Suddenly, he seems genuinely interested in international politics and is continually trying to acquire knowledge on the current situation. His interest lasts just another two days. Then he tells us he's going to fly to Geneva with Wadala Abu Sakr. His choice of traveling companion surprises me. Abu Sakr is the most senior head of security in the presidential palace. A powerful man. He controls all of Saddam Hussein's bodyguards and is responsible for their training. The two men stay in Geneva for two days on a secret mission. But when they get back news of what they were up to circulates round the palace in no time. Abu Sakr was in Geneva to employ Cubans. Elite soldiers who are to be used as extra bodyguards for ministers and leading party members. These mysterious mercenaries are occupying four stories of the Al Hayat building in the palace grounds. When they have shooting practice, the ranges are closed to the rest of us. Any contact with them is strictly forbidden. We hear they're being paid in US dollars and not Iraqi dinars. Not just a normal Iraqi wage, but millions although precise figures aren't mentioned. I don't ask as it seems too sensitive a subject. The Cubans are another costly element in the murky and overstretched security operation in the presidential palace. June 1990 Saddam Hussein is once again holding family meetings with unusual frequency. After these meetings, Uday used to chatter in considerable detail about what was discussed. Normally he only gives hints like, Iraq has a million soldiers, Kuwait has only 17,000, a pathetic air force and an apology of a navy with just 20 patrol boats. All the navy does is smuggle alcohol into the country for some of the princes. The sons of bitches forbid their people alcohol while they themselves have orgies and a monopoly on drinking alcohol. Every sentence Uday utters stresses the military superiority of Iraq and insults the Kuwaiti royal family. Kuwait is governed by the Al Sabah family. On the 31st of December 1977, Sheikh Jabir al Ahmad al Jabir al Sabah became the 13th Emir of Kuwait. The Crown Prince and Head of Government was Sheikh Saad al Abdallah al Salam al Sabah. Their finance minister was Sheikh Ali al Khalifa al Sabah. The foreign minister was Sheikh Sabah al Ahmad al Jabir al Sabah. Minister of the Interior was Sheikh Salim al Sabah al Salim, and Defense Minister was Sheikh Nawaf al Ahmad al Jabir al Sabah. So all the important powerful positions are held by members of the Emir's family. Uday is indignant about this, which is ludicrously hypocritical because things are exactly the same in Iraq. His father surrounds himself with family members but even family bonds are not a guarantee of survival as Adnan Kerala's death proved. Unlike in Iraq, 
a strong opposition is allowed in Kuwait. Even open criticism of the emir is permitted. In Iraq, one disloyal word against the president can be a death sentence. So, by Arab standards, Kuwait is one of the most open and tolerant countries in the region. What it lacks is a national assembly that would give the population of Kuwait some say in the running of their country. Such a national assembly did exist once but, because of the openness with which many of the members criticized the ruling family, the emir dissolved it. But in early 1990, many former Kuwaiti members of it began a campaign for new elections to a new national assembly with extended powers. It quickly gained massive support. This was widely reported in Iraq. The reports implied there were mass demonstrations against the emir, uprisings and violent repressive measures by the Kuwaiti police. Whatever the truth, the al Sabah family yielded to public pressure and, in June 1990, elections to a 75-seat National Assembly were held. A joke, was Uday's verdict, because a third of them are going to be appointed by the emir. And in any case this farce will be boycotted by the opposition. We in Iraq must support that opposition with all the means at our disposal. Uday goes on to explain in greater detail how he envisages this will happen. The people will have to take to the streets because the bigger the gatherings the greater the pressure will be on the government. If thousands of Kuwaitis protest, the royal family will lose their nerve and order the police to shoot them. Uday doesn't say it out loud but I know what he's thinking. He knows that, when compared to Iraq, Kuwait is a tiny state consisting of just 17,818 square kilometers. Only 800,000 out of the country's 2 million population are Kuwaiti citizens and a mere 100,000 of these are true Kuwaitis or members of the ancient Bedouin nobility. The ruling al Sabah family numbers just 1,000. The majority of the population is made up of foreign workers. There are approximately 1.2 million of them. About 440,000, or a good third of these, are Palestinian. The rest are a mixture of Arabs from other states, Asians, Europeans, and Americans. This population mix produces big social divisions because only Kuwaitis enjoy full citizenship. In the event of an invasion, all these foreigners are unlikely to put up much of a defense for a country that isn't theirs. Certainly the Palestinians won't as they have good relations with Iraq and regard Saddam as the only Arab leader with the strength, will and hatred to destroy Israel. We must support our Palestinian brothers in Kuwait in all matters because they are not true Kuwaitis. Without them, the country could not survive economically, Uday says philosophically. They have to resist the exploitative regime of the al Sabahs. Uday also mentions some names and confirms that the Iraqi secret police have spent weeks trying to persuade Kuwaiti politicians and opponents of the al Sabah regime to rise up and fight openly against the government. We've talked with Ahmed al Sadoun, claims Uday. Ahmed al Sadoun is one of the best known opposition politicians in Kuwait. Another is Mohammed al Quadri of the Democratic Forum. They both agree with us, lies Uday, they are both openly calling for an invasion by Iraq to topple the fiendish system in their country. Uday couldn't have got this more wrong. In fact, both politicians had categorically rejected the proposal of any kind of collaboration with Iraq and had no wish to be used as pawns by Saddam. But this doesn't stop Uday declaring his intention, we will hurry to our brother's aid and drive out the corrupt government which takes its pleasure in London with homosexuals and whores. Uday can't resist telling us what Saddam's master plan for Kuwait is. Firstly, the rapid invasion into Kuwait by Iraqi troops to support a revolutionary opposition group that has asked Baghdad for help. Then the elimination of the emir and his whole government. Republican troops will go straight to the Dasman Palace and storm it as quickly as possible to seize the Kuwaiti ruler. If he declares himself willing to cooperate and to remain in office as head of a puppet regime obeying orders from Baghdad, then his life will be spared. But if, as expected, he refuses then he will be shot on the spot for resisting the friendly Iraqi forces. His whole clan will also be executed. Saddam Hussein had already put the first step of the plan into action by preparing his army for war. By the end of June 1990, everyone in the palace knew troops were being mobilized towards Kuwait. 30,000 men were stationed along the Kuwaiti border, in the Al Sayyid Club, over gin and tonics, businessmen who had just come back from Basra and southern Iraq, 
described how when driving along the al qadisya motorway linking Baghdad and Kuwait, they got stuck in endless traffic jams. The delay was caused by slow-moving army tanks and trucks towing artillery guns which were heading south towards Kuwait. Huge military camps have been seen erected beside the motorway. I ask Uday about this and he confirms that troops have been ordered south. Purely as a precautionary measure, Uday advises, just in case our Kuwaiti brothers need our help against the corrupt al-Sabah regime. How many troops have been moved? I ask. Uday's reply surprises me. More than 100,000. That tells me zero hour is nearly upon us. The countdown clock is ticking away. It's the 1st of August 1990. Uday gets up and sets off unusually early, supposedly going to the Olympic Club. He calls me at 9 a.m. and tells me to keep myself ready over the next few hours. He doesn't say what I've got to keep myself ready for but he gives away a clue. The phone line is crackling but I know the connection to the Olympic Club is always crystal clear. It sounds like he's a long way away or maybe in a bunker of some kind. When I see the news that afternoon, my suspicions are confirmed. Uday and the whole leadership of Iraq have withdrawn to safe areas. The newsreader informs the Iraqi population. Discussions in Jeddah between an Iraqi delegation led by the deputy president of the Iraqi Revolutionary Council, Izzat Ibrahim and the Kuwaiti Prime Minister, Crown Prince Saad al-Abdallah Salem al-Sabah ended with open provocation and aggression against Iraq. The speaker pauses for a moment as if to let the dramatic news sink in and keep the viewers in suspense. Then he continues, Kuwait refused to agree to Iraqi proposals that they concede territory in the border region of the Rumela oil field. And, in addition, Kuwait refused to pay compensation for the loss Iraq has incurred as a result of Kuwait's increased oil production. Kuwait also refused the striking of credit from the time of Iraq's war with Iran. The discussions broke down after two hours. Izzat Ibrahim immediately flew back to Baghdad. As soon as his plane landed, the border between Iraq and Kuwait was closed. Meanwhile, it's pandemonium in the palace grounds. Convoys of ministers, party officials and all their bodyguards are turning up every minute. Helicopters land and take off again. All security troops are on red alert. The number of palace sentries manning the gates has been trebled. All soldiers have been grounded. The phone lines from the Al Hayat building have been blocked. Everyone is tense and hurried but not nervous, strangely excited if anything. Everything is going to a plan that's been practiced and trained for hundreds of times. That evening, I go to the shooting club. Two of my bodyguards accompany me. The club is almost deserted. The few people there are members of the security service. I practice firing my pistol. For some reason, my aim is particularly good. Shortly after midnight, Another bodyguard hurries into the club. He's very excited and tells me to go to with him to my apartment. As we walk there, he tells me, Saddam is going to Kuwait in the next few hours. How do you know that? I ask. We've just found out from project number 7, is his reply. On the 2nd of August 1990, at about 2 a.m. in the morning, our tanks crossed the Kuwaiti border at al Abdali. 350 tanks head for Kuwait City at their top speed of 60 miles per hour. As Uday predicted, and everyone in Iraq expected, there's hardly any Kuwaiti resistance. The following day I find out more details. The Kuwaiti border troops fled in panic. The only gun battles were on the outskirts of Kuwait City. A few brave individual Kuwaitis tried to stop our tank columns with bullets but they were simply crushed. Even the Kuwaiti Air Force didn't put up any resistance. The pilots raced to their airbases, started up their country's 36 Mirage fighters, took off and flew straight to Saudi Arabia. That first night, I don't sleep for a single second. I get caught up in patriotic zeal and want to celebrate with my bodyguards but we refrain and wait tensely for news and orders from Uday. But he doesn't ring. It isn't until the evening of the 3rd August when he finally calls and summons me to Project No. 7. The place is full to bursting. All Uday's friends are there. Hundreds of cars are parked outside. Azam tells me Uday has planned a big victory party at the Al Saeed Club. His masters of ceremonies have already been organizing it. 
we all drive to the club in a huge convoy. On the way there some overexcited people can't resist firing their guns through the open car windows. This evening the Al Said is the most bizarre sight I've ever seen. Outside the front door is a line of cars that would make you think you were standing at a dealership specializing in luxury vehicles. The club is packed with people. The whole of Baghdad's high society is there. The whole place is beautifully lit. Both the summer and winter pools shimmer in a myriad of colors. In every corner, sumptuous buffets are laid out. Liveried servants pass through the crowd balancing their trays of champagne glasses. There are smiles all round and the mood is relaxed. When Uday makes a grand entrance with about a hundred bodyguards, a hush descends. Then everyone bursts into thunderous applause. They all clap so hard their hands must sting. Some bow down in front of Uday. A few kiss his hand. Uday is in his element surfing on a wave of patriotic enthusiasm. He's wearing his Ray-Bans and his black uniform with Uday Saddam Hussein in gold thread lettered on it. He doesn't walk, he strides, walking on air. In his left hand, he holds his Havana. With his right hand, he waves to his subjects as if in slow motion. He occasionally stops for a moment, runs his hand through a girl's hair then walks on watched by hundreds of pairs of adoring eyes. I keep well in the background. It's odd. Although I look so similar to Ude, because I'm wearing my bodyguard's uniform, hardly anyone gives me a second glance. Everyone concentrates on the radiant hero, the great son of our victorious president. After enjoying the adulation of the crowd, Ude strides up to a microphone. As if he was announcing the opening of the Olympic Games, he shouts into the microphone as if failing to realize the whole point of it is to amplify his voice. We have achieved our aim. He booms. Then he puts down the microphone, grabs his nearest bodyguard's Kalashnikov and fires it into the air until the magazine's empty. While he does this, he shouts at all the men present to do the same. All of a sudden, they all seem to have guns in their hands and fire up into the clear, starry night sky above Baghdad. The firing reminds me of my time in the front line during the last war. I can't help think that probably more shots have been fired at the Al Said Club than were fired during the whole invasion of Kuwait. Of course, the successful invasion is the main topic of conversation. From snippets I overhear, I gather that our troops occupied all the key positions in Kuwait just four hours after crossing the border. Nine hours after hostilities started, our soldiers were celebrating their victory in the streets of Kuwait City. They now have complete control of everywhere. Even the Dasman Palace is occupied. Radio and television stations have been taken over by our people and are broadcasting Iraqi propaganda. The only serious fighting took place near the Dasman Palace at the northern end of the peninsula on which Kuwait City was built. It was here that the Kuwaiti resistance gathered. These brave patriots were determined to fight despite overwhelming odds and were led by none other than Uday's friend Fahd al-Ahmed al-Sabah, the emir's brother. Fahd had been in Baghdad only weeks before. When Uday is told Fahd was killed fighting to protect his country, Uday offers a cynical eulogy. What an idiot! He was like my brother. Like myself, he was president of his country's Olympic Committee and Football Association. Why didn't he yield to us? He could have been my deputy. What was he trying to prove by being stupid like that? Fahd al-Ahmed al-Sabah had tried to repel the attacking Iraqi soldiers with members of the Emir's Guard. He didn't stand a chance. The instant he stepped out on top of the palace steps, his pistol drawn, a 21-year-old Iraqi cut him down with a salvo from his Kalashnikov. When Fahd fell, all Kuwaiti resistance also collapsed. The sheikh's corpse was dragged into the road where it was run over by a tank. His remains were then just left at the side of the road, that sickening treatment didn't worry Uday. It's war, was his arrogant justification. We didn't want to kill anyone. We just wanted to support the revolutionary forces in Kuwait. There was one fact Uday omitted to mention that evening. An important fact. The emir and all his ministers managed to flee to safety. As soon as our troops violated the border, 
Kuwaiti officers warned the whole government. As Iraqi tanks sped to the Kuwaiti capital, the emir and all his government ministers were speeding to Saudi Arabia. The following day, the 4th August, I hear of a further setback. None of the members of the Iraqi opposition will agree to form a new government beholden to Saddam. Everyone in the palace knows the significance of this. Iraq's declaration to the world's media that Iraq had been acting in good faith to support a popular revolution in a despot state was revealed as a sham. But Saddam Hussein isn't overly concerned. That same day, he still has a transitional government installed in Kuwait City. Kuwait is declared a republic. At a press conference in Baghdad, the world is informed that the head of Kuwait's new government is a certain Colonel Allah Hussein Ali who is an officer in the Kuwaiti army. Somewhat surprising, this officer isn't presented to the world's media. Not even a photograph of him is produced. Now I know why. No such Kuwaiti officer of that name exists. The man chosen to run Kuwait is Hussein Kamal Hassan who is actually in the Iraqi army and happens to be married to Saddam Hussein's oldest daughter, Ragd. I can hardly believe the audacity of it all. Hussein Kamal Hassan is known in Baghdad as Saddam's loyal hound and deservedly so. He started as an ordinary police constable. He later became chauffeur to former Iraqi President Hassan al bekr He kept that position until 1979 when Saddam replaced al bekr as president. As I mentioned earlier, al bekr officially died of a heart attack. He was actually poisoned and many people believed it was Hussein Kamal who poisoned his master's food. Hussein Kamal is also from Tikrit and is closely related to Saddam. After Saddam's succession, Hussein Kamal was rapidly promoted from a mere chauffeur in this reinforced suspicions. Saddam appointed him as first bodyguard, a role more important than any ministerial post. Hussein Kamal received the rank of lieutenant although he'd never trained as an officer. That was beside the point. What mattered was complete loyalty. In order to bind Hussein Kamal even closer to him, Saddam married him to his eldest daughter. Hussein Kamal has two brothers, Saddam Kamal and Hakim Kamal. To keep everything in order and the family stuck together like superglue, these two also had to marry into Saddam's clan. Saddam Kamal married Saddam's daughter Rina. The brothers were also given the most palatial villas imaginable within the palace grounds. After his marriage to Ragd, Hussein Kamal was given responsibility for Iraq's armament program. A special arms ministry was created for that very purpose. Despite his humble beginning, Hussein Kamal became minister of the new department as well as the Ministry of Industry which, until then, had been responsible for arms production. But even his trophy wife in those roles didn't satisfy his insatiable craving for power. He also had his eye on the oil ministry. He didn't have to wait long. Saddam Hussein forced the incumbent oil minister to issue a public self-denunciation. On the television news, the minister confessed to selling Iraq's oil for personal gain. His whole body was trembling so much it was clear to anyone watching that the man was under terrible pressure. Shortly afterwards he died in an Iraqi hospital. Heart failure was the official cause of death. The loyal hound didn't waste a day in taking over the oil ministry responsibilities. Hussein Kamal was also given the defense ministry vacancy when it was left vacant by Adnan Kerala's death in the helicopter crash. The transport ministry also followed. Hussein Kamal, the man without a degree or any other qualification had become an Iraqi minister four times over and now he was also in charge of the whole of Kuwait. Not bad for a chauffeur and suspected poisoner. Follow for the next chapter.